the memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the run. This is uh, Dr. Liliana Oakes. Uh, she's from Roman, and she's to be a, a, a BA -er for uh, quite a bit, and she's uh, taught a lot of fellows here. And today she's be talking about the uh, model of palliative care for seniors at home. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Liliana Oakes. Hi everyone, I'm glad to be back here. Thank you to all the audience that is, uh, oops, that is uh, seeing us right now uh, in the virtual world. Uh, I'm very excited to be here because I have been with this amazing institute for many years and it's always good to come and present new ideas, innovative models of care, and that's what I'm going to walk you through in the next hour, something that is happening in San Antonio, really exciting, and I'm going to uh, hopefully show you how you can do integrated models of care that actually will bring quality uh, services to seniors and palliative care at home. It's also great because this program is very interprofessional, so I always like to ask in the audience, and I have some familiar faces every time that I come here, uh, how many of you are nurses, if you can raise your hand? Okay, we have some nurses. What about social workers? Always we have a great group of social workers. Uh, what about therapists? Very good, welcome. Wow, we have three or four. Uh, what about MDs? Any MDs? We have here some of my dear friends. Um, what about chaplains? Okay, oh, so you are in dual role. That is awesome. So she multitasking her job. I was a chaplain before I became nurse. That is fabulous. It's a ministry, right? So both of them complement each other wonderfully. Um, anybody else? Maybe hygienists. Sometimes we have dental hygienists. Okay, great. We're representing you. I'm also a caregiver. Oh, you're a caregiver. So great. Any of you are already a caregiver? Maybe dealing with parents, grandparents, or maybe a neighbor? Yeah, we have several people. So again, this talk is great because all of you will feel part of your heart in this talk, and, and all of you are so important in what we do in senior care that I wanted to say thank you for what you're doing. So let me tell you a little bit about WellMed. Is, it's a little bit different from what you maybe have here in the talks this week. WellMed is a managed care system means we take a global risk for a patient. So our goals are really quality improvement because it's no fee for service. We don't feel just uh, one time, two times, three times. This. We receive certain amount of uh, money depending on the complexity of the patient. And our goals are let us bring all the team and we want them to be healthy. So it's very focused on prevention, very focused into giving the patient everything they need in terms of team approach. And uh, the idea is that they don't have uh, bad outcomes, meaning inappropriate ER hospitalizations or dying in the hospital. So you're going to hear a lot of things that maybe in other models of care are common, but we're really big into measuring if what we're doing actually is making an impact or not. And uh, so I don't have any financial disclosures, but if anybody has a proposal, talk to me at the end. Um, I wanted to introduce you uh, a patient. She is real. She was in my team uh, six months ago. And uh, she will help us to understand what you can do for a senior at home in the model that we're trying to implement uh, that is being successful in San Antonio and Texas. She's 84, she's Hispanic, she has very low literacy, um, she uh, speaks only Spanish. Uh, some of her children are really bilingual, some of them, the oldest one, immigrated with her so they remain only Spanish speakers, so that's a challenge there. Um, she lives in the south side of San Antonio. Uh, a lot of children, she has two children that live at home, but they're really busy. They work all day long, and they have children, but all of them go to school. So she's spending long hours at home by herself. She got history of severe asthma. Just to give you a sense of what severe asthma is, um, I work in, in my palliative care clinic. We have 
uh, care of around 2,000 seniors that come to this clinic. She was the worst asthmatic that they have among the population. This lady went frequently to the hospital, uh, continuously have wheezing, um, and they were providing what we will consider a standard of care for her. She got also her hardest already in class, three or four meaning she, uh, with very minimal movement, got really tired. So just dressing, feeding herself, uh, took a toll on her because her heart also was failing. And of course, she got already kidney problems. So keep her in mind, because we're going to, again, talk about her uh, later on. So uh, I already mentioned this. She got multiple admissions. She is swollen, uh, very poor symptom control. She is sad. She's in pain. She feels isolated. Um, so again, one of the things that I would like that we think in terms of looking about the patient as a whole is we don't treat diseases. She's not an asthmatic. She is an elderly lady that has a family life, goals. It just happened to have a broken world, a broken body that is suffering, right? So again, we always look into her story. So her story is she's isolated too. She cannot care for herself and the family cannot care for herself. So um, she's having accidents going to the bathroom. She's in a room here and the bathroom is 30 feet away with somebody that will take three steps and cannot move longer. So you can imagine the level of uh, anxiety and, and symptoms that we found. Um, the regular care in this patient, potentially, if, if, if you just met her, um, what do you think will happen to her? What do you think will be the end of the story? You are meeting her today, and what do you think will happen to her at this point? Somebody raise your hand and... So she has a poor prognosis unless we could do something for her. Very good. What else comes to your mind? What do you think will happen? She could fall and, and make She could fall and, and, and have a break. So she's so frail that she's a reason really bad things like falls and then you break the hip and then after you break the hip you don't walk and you don't want to get a blood clot in your morning and you die, right? And it could be a sequence. Have you seen that sequence happening? What else do you think could have happened? Where do you think she will die? So some of you says home and somebody says anything else? Maybe to the hospital or potentially the nursing home. So at this point, we cannot predict when she will die, but say that you are part of that family. Raise your hand if you would like her to die in the hospital connected to tubes and needles and all of those great things that we do. <laughs> Nobody, right? I usually never find there are some few people that will choose hospital. The majority of you in the data shows people don't like to die. Raise your hand if you would like to see her die in the nursing home. That's come on, come on. Right, so I never get a lot of volunteers with that one. How many of you uh, will love to see her dying at home? In her bed, close to her lamp, her little muñequitos, her little things that she has, her little virgin of, that she was devoted to, and Jesus. Okay, so the majority of you say, so, so let's see how you can accomplish that because that's what the majority of people in the country would like to have, but it doesn't happen to everyone. So again, we wanted to break with different models of care, those trajectories. So again, um, the idea is in the regular care, many of you answered that question. She maybe would have been admitted in ICU because when you cannot breathe, um, you need to do something. And that something is we have available machines and artificial nutrition, artificial ventilation. Um, she maybe will have a catastrophic, catastrophic use of services, meaning these patients can cost thousands of dollars at end of life, even though her prognosis is limited. And this is probably the worst. Pain, suffering, unresolved issues. Remember how she lived by herself and she feels a burden to the family. Um, and family left with a bad memory. Maybe some of you have stories like that in your own family a memory that is not the best. So these causes are palliative care and hospice are vital because they are intended to meet in the gap and provide in a different way options to patients that are critically. That's what palliative care is. It's another layer of support 
and another interprofessional service of uh, professionals that wanted to give options and wanted to give the best care to a patient that is going through a very serious condition, that is going through a lot of things that potentially can end up in a really bad story and hopefully address those issues that usually medicine left behind. Because again, it's a medical model focused on disease, not on people. So I think geriatrics and palliative care uh, try to bring back that concept of patient, the caregiver, the family, the neighbor, the church, everybody that's surrounded the individual. So the idea is that palliative care really is the pain and other symptoms and attempting to improve the quality of life. It's appropriate at any age, so you could do palliative care with a child that has been born with a birth defect in the heart that is going to end it up in, you know, dying. You could do palliative care, even if the family decided to go with a surgery, receive treatment, appropriate to do palliative care. It's appropriate to do palliative care if you are 40 years old and you are diagnosed with breast cancer and you wanted to fight it back because you have three little kids, you can receive palliative care. Or you are 95 years old and you are in a terminal dementia process and you would like to close the journey and manage symptoms, you can get palliative care. So palliative care can be given at any time, any age, regardless of how aggressive you want the treatment. Uh, hospice, on the other hand, is a benefit paid by Medicare and it's also a service like palliative care that is given pro interprofessionally. But you are looking into a patient that you are not going to be surprised if they are dead in six months. So this is at the end of their terminal illness, the patient has declined profoundly and everybody agree the patient probably is not going to be with us in six months. It's also a, a point where the treatments, we move from um, uh, uh, curing to caring, which is a very important, we never give up. It's just the care look different. And that's very important when you talk to your loved ones or your patients, is we never give up. Um, I hear somebody saying in the palliative care world that palliative care is the ICU for the dying. You know, isn't it that interesting? So we always think about ICU machines and material, but when you are dying and you are really preparing to die, the best thing will do palliative care. Because it's equally important. It's just no machines, it's just no tubes, it's just a very intense care focusing into emotion, emotional and spiritual and physical issues. So this is another way to look into that. We used to be in a model of care where we have life prolonging care. And then boom, patient meet the criteria, there are the specific things for diseases, we enter hospice and you die. However, in this life prolonging care, there was a lot of things that we were not doing right. So now the model, what we're trying to do is do something like this. We can continue doing life prolonging care, we can start getting palliative care even very early on, and then when the patient is getting critical, we can transition them to hospice care. So hospice care can provide palliative care, but palliative care is not hospice. And I hope that this slide can help you to see. It's a continuum of okay. care. But in the case of uh, our lady, uh, she has asthma. Asthma does not have to mean that she's you know, like a terminal. So that uh, if the palliative care is the intervention kind of that we spoke of, she can be fine, right? So it's a great question. What you are saying, what is your name? Gina. Gina is saying, well, in the case of the lady, she's thinking about her lady. She has a disease that doesn't seem to be that bad. It's asthma. And if you palliate her, she's going to live long periods of time. Did I get it correct, more or less? So what makes a patient, or what kind of th signs or symptoms can a patient with asthma let us know that the patient is actually going to have a poor prognosis? What do you think in her story, going back to the story, so we answer your question, is telling us that her asthma is actually pretty critical. Exactly. If the patient has been previously intubated, that's a severity. So it's not like, I'm an asthmatic, by the way, 
I mean, my asthmatic, I use a butyrol once every three months, except when the cedar is in San Antonio. That's a different story. But by definition, I hope to live many years. In her case, this lady has been multiple admissions, very sick. So what else can, can help us to answer? The comorbidities. This lady has CHF class 3 and 4. This is not your mild CHF. Her heart is failing. Very good. What else? Her renal failure. So when we see into a person, the, the idea is that you see the whole picture. And, and, and diabetes or whatever, I mean, you can add her uh, other diseases, but I think with those three that you have, you are entertained enough to know that her asthma due to the other diseases and the hospitalizations and the intubation are putting her in a category of somebody that needs palliation, but you also start thinking, how many months or years that she has, right? Are you thinking about that in the case? Is there anything else that we didn't discuss here that maybe somebody wants to ask? Yes. Well, I was also thinking then also about her like depression and anxiety because wouldn't those really affect, you know? Have you, have you guys been anxious or, or very depressed in your lives? Don't raise your hand, just think about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. A little is a psychologist that means business and they won't be allowed to take it. So that's huge. What When human beings are depressed. There is a study that shows in many diseases, HIV cancer, these patients have less, worse prognosis than the ones that have uh, a strong feelings, a lot of family support, incredible spirituality. The patients that I have care more with the longest cancer are the ones that have more joy in their lives, great social support, and an incredible faith in God. So yes, when you have a patient that is giving up for other reasons, emotionally and spiritually, that also adds yeah. in your equation to determine if somebody is going to really pull through or not. So, very good. So, did we answer all of us your question, more or less? Let's see how it goes in a second and that will help. Okay, so any questions about this slide? Because it's very important that we understand these concepts because when we initiated this integrated model of care, and we have a patient with a CHF exacerbation, for the second time at the hospital, we requested an inpatient palliative care consultation. And the answer was like, oh no, the patient is not dying. So we needed to tell the hospitalist, that's the whole point. We are not talking about hospice. We're talking about, are you talking about the future? Are you talking about symptom management? Are you talking about what is important for this patient? And, and, and that takes a while, you know, I mean, we have great models of care that are already in the city being very advanced, like the VA hospital, UHS, um, there are more hospitals that need them, uh, because we need to change the perception and educate the public that these are just, again, extra layer of support to bring that um, care for seriously ill, critically ill people. Okay. So why palliative care is essential? Because the idea is that you're taking your higher risk patients, and that's what we also did in our organization in WellMed. We wanted to be sure that those sickest of the sickest were having right away a service that can address all the aspects in their care. So we wanted, we got the data, and we found that 3% of the entire population of 48,000 beneficiaries in San Antonio could benefit from palliative care right away. Those include your patients that, due to the claims and the data, we found they were using a lot of resources. Uh, the PCPs, the primary care doctors were frustrated. The social worker didn't know what else to do with these patients. The nurses were seeing them coming. And something was missing with these seriously ill people. Elucidates patient wishes. So again, it's not about, are you taking your inhaler, which is important? Are you, taking, are you using your oxygen? But you are asking them, are you thinking about what is your next step? What are you missing in your life that now is so critical that your life has changed? Um, how is that impacting your decision making? Is there any other things in your life that we maybe are not working well and are making a, a worsening of your diseases? Um, are you thinking about if you get really sick or you will need to be hospitalized, would you like to go one more time? And it's amazing, but when we change the dialogue from disease-oriented to what is important to the patient, many of them said, 
You're the first doctor that asked me if I wanted to go to the hospital. I hate the hospital. I don't want it to go anymore. Nobody has asked that, right? Or I am so tired, they never find my veins. They stick me 20 times, look oh, yeah. at my arms. I hate my arms. I'm a pretty girl, I'm 80 years old, I shouldn't be purple. <laughs> they hate that. I hate it. Somebody likes me this year? Don't, don't say that. <laughs> so, there is a different dialogue when you're doing politics. You know, you just slow down. You, you really look and see and spend time. So being a geriatrician and a palliative care doctor, I love my job because of that. We have more time. We really wanted to see what the whole picture is and working with the caregiver. Sometimes the mom says, I'm giving up. I don't want to go to the hospital. And the lawyer is like, mom, but you know, we're going to let you do that. So facilitating mm -hmm. negotiation, right? Everybody is in a different journey. The idea is that these uh, services in palliative care, they have national data, decrease the ARBs and hospitalizations. For two reasons. One, because people don't like hospitals. <clears throat> Again, there is always an exception. But hospitals are places made for the sick. They have diseases. They, they humanize humans. I mean, we have the ACE unit that is attempting to change that model in the city and really allow families to come and have a beautiful environment and all of that. But, it's not a standard of care yet. Every hospital should do that. Yeah. So again, the idea is if a person needs to really go and use it, go. But we're finding that a lot of seniors were using the ER as a primary care office, <laughs> or they're utilizing services that are not appropriate. And the idea is also this big gap that we timely refer people to hospice. And I'm going to show you that. Also improve patient and family quality of life by decreasing suffering suffering when we have a country that can offer so much sometimes we don't know where to stop and then we can from treating and improving quality of life we ended up in suffering in isolation so it's a fine line that we need to remind ourselves as healthcare workers in all of our professions where do we set the boundary where do we see and set a limit so we don't go from again this ongoing search for prolongation of life. If that is the goal of care for few, you can negotiate it, but there is always need to be a limit. Okay, so let me show you data and how we're also changing this with our model of care involvement. The median length of a stay in hospice is around 18 days in 2013. This is national day. So let me ask you, if you would have and God forbid and be diagnosed with a terminal illness, how many of you will have time to close your journey in 18 days? I never have got any hands up. Because humans cannot close a journey in 18 days. There is so much that we wish to do. There is so much that we dream that didn't come through. There is people that we need to say goodbye. There is time with God that we need to make peace at. And 18 days is not enough. And that's a horrible day that when I think about it and anybody think about it, with cancer, with uh, dementia care, with CHA, with COPD, it's not it. It's difficult to do prognostication because that's a whole topic by itself. So I just met a family this week that they were struggling to see their mom who is end of life. Her kidney is only 20%, her liver is gone, she looks emaciated around 80 pounds. And the family says, my mom has been dying for 10 years. You doctors keep saying, in, in, in 10 years, your mom has five. In five, she's dying in two. In two, she's dying in six. Mm -hmm. And three months ago, you told me two weeks and she's still here. Why you don't want it to give her IV fluids? You see where we go? Yeah. So it took it, uh, two hours of conversation. Where are you coming from? Explaining that I'm dying. And, but it is hard to prognosticate. And not like we, we, we do it. Uh, because we don't know because many doctors are competent, it's just sometimes there are diseases that are hard to prognosticate and we're doing tools. There is a tool called e-prognostication that is trying to see how we can become better because it's hard when we tell these to families, right? How you do, do strategize. Um, there is also a lot of reluctance to accept hospice, again, misconceptions. Unfortunately, not all the hospices can negotiate or provide the best care, so again, Looking around, we have 52 in San Antonio right now, so which one do you partner, which ones really can help with more specific programs and so forth. 
So this is crazy because if you look at this data in proportion of patients by length of essay in 2011, uh, over 50 of the 50 percent they stay in hospital less than 30 days. That is still really, really low. The other data, and I'm going to summarize that, so don't worry, I'm not going to tell you to, to read it, is they published this great article in JAMA in 2013 that the summary is 25% of our Medicare beneficiaries are using 75% um, of the resources at the end of life. So I repeat, for the ones that are falling asleep on me, some of you are falling asleep on me, wake up, wake up. 25% of your bene, bene, be, uh, Medicare beneficiaries are using tons of money. And when you're looking into the 30-day data, it's even worse. It's huge. It's close to 50%. So it is uh, all of that to, risk, uh, to summarize that. Again, look at the ICU close to people that die in ICU, 30%. Imagine that 30 out of 100 patients are dying in ICU. And that's huge. That's gigantic. So it, that's brutal. I mean, ICUs are great for the reversible causes, but when you are dying, that's kind of crazy. So hospice, very little utilization. So we, we, we thought, you know, th this is not what we wanted to do uh, and well met. You know, this is cost again. This is another slide to read it differently. So again, impact of palliative care. So then we look into the model around, uh, Dr. Glazer started implementing this model at the end of 2013. So well met gave her two months of full-time job was to read articles. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I came just a few months after her, so but she got two months and well met said, go and read everything, prepare the best protocol, and implement a program that can break that cycle. So all of these data, she said, wow, it's a lot of savings. There is plenty of articles that have shown that when you have use of usual care, it's really expensive. And when you use palliative care, you decrease the cost. And some of those close to 50%. So we decided, well, we, we need to do two things. There are two kinds of patients, more or less, that we decided to do a well -made. One is a patient that is still active, so your 40-year-old unfortunate mother of three that has breast cancer, but she likes to keep working. She wants to get the chemo, the radio, whatever she chooses. And she wants to continue going out because she goes to church, she likes her doctor. And those are patients that really want aggressive therapy, but they are not homebound. But we also saw a huge need for the sickest of the sickest that is horrible to get them out of. Again, I cover the south side of San Antonio, so if any of you work in the south, you know the demographics and the economics are very different. So if some of your veterans, you are VA base, that even the south look very different as veterans that have all. So again, not a stereotype, but it's the reality of the city. So we have seniors that uh, to go to the doctor is a six hour, yeah. right? They need to get out, they're really slow, they're demented, so the caregiver needs to base yourself first, then you need to press your mom, and then you need to feed her, and she already is eating very slow, and by the time that the comfort care, which is the transportation system, come, and bring, you name it. Yeah. So it's like a whole ordeal. And some of them don't even have relatives, so we have a lot of loners, a lot of seniors that by the grace of God are living independently, and they just don't have anybody. We need enable checks on them that they cannot drive anymore. So we said we need to strategize and make a program that can serve both needs and that can be located in all uh, areas in town. And we wanted to also measure our program. You know, everything is data, data talks. So when you have a program, you wanted to see if this is making a difference. So we said, let's see how we take care of the homebound. Let's see if we can make a difference with the ER visit and hospitalization. Let us see if we can improve advanced care planning, goals of care, find out what patient's wishes are, because if they really wanted to die home naturally, they should not be taken at the end of life to the ICU. And you can do that by addressing your advanced plan. We wanted to improve pain and symptom management. So those are the initial things that we did. So going back to our lady, we uh, brought the primary care doctor call me and said, she is our worst asthmatic. She's very sick. And from this last admission, she looks even worse. Um, can you see her? So we took all the team. We have a nurse. We have a social worker, myself at that point. We went and did a family meeting. Uh, we found out that she needed more equipment. 
Vichy has a bathroom that is 30 feet away. We needed to get her a simple commode and the bedroom. Something so simple that nobody has thought about that because when the patients come to the office, I, I, I always tell my, my primary care doctors that are awesome doctors, it's like you have a, a, a different, it's like a virtual reality. You see the patient with the makeup, and they come that day and they take the bath that they haven't taken two weeks. Right. And they get their hair done, and then you have them for 15, 30 minutes tops, and then they go back home with their 30 cats, no food in their refrigerator, they hate the heating, so I don't do my hair anymore because why to do her in all the houses don't have any AC in the summer. <laughs> I did yeah. it for you guys. <laughs> so, life looks very different when you go in the private because I'm like, I prescribe and she's in five blood pressure meds and her blood pressure is bad. And then we go to the home, wow, we found 50 medications, all of them, beautifully decorated in the cabinet, and she doesn't take any of the ones that you do, so you keep buying and she keeps putting them there, and, because, and they are delusional and demented, so they said, I'm not taking the little white pill because that little white pill is the one that they have a bad dream that night, and I'm not going to take the little white pill. So then we go there and we do a whole transformation with pill boxes, we decrease medications, we put patches, um, and we do, we, we meaning I have done pill boxes in their home, and, I have changed the diaper and I have warmed up the egg because it's the only food they have that day. Change is very different. All of that is palliation. You are bringing comfort. You are understanding how to live. Yeah. And, and they have lived this for a long time, this way. So it's really hard for us as healthcare workers. But when you enter the home, it's, a, it's like a sacred territory. Yeah. They tell you where to sit. No, 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 my, my cat sits there. You, you sit there. <laughs> No, 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 you please don't, uh, don't eat that here. No, I don't want, can I wash my hands here? No, 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 you need to go to the, it's their territory, it's a sacred territory. So you need to learn the rituals where you want it to see, um, how you do with the pets. Um, and you really start listening to the whole story and seeing the whole story. And the whole story sometimes is more than the asthma, the CHF. And that's what we found with this lady. There were a lot of simple things like, I am using a diaper because I cannot go 30 feet to the whole room, and that could all make her so happy. Simple interventions, so the right equipment at the right time. Um, we also talk about she was getting dehydrated with her heart failure. We were already diuresing her with a lot of, and she was getting dry, so we also modified the way that she should drink by mouth and getting her things so she can have them there because the kitchen was also far away. So if she's by herself, how you're going to go and reach for water or put more lime or lemon. So we make a lot of simple adaptations in the visit. Did you put a refrigerator in her room? Yes, we check and we talk about the family. Keep her in a small yeah. cooler, yeah. just, again, simple things that you're like, oh, that, you know, why would you think about that? You know, like uh, suddenly a, 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 a ham moment. And we start talking more about how you're feeling, you know. She was feeling horrible. I hate the hospital sometimes. Look at me. I'm breathing the same as when I went to the hospital. They have put every single medication. And I added it. Mm -hmm. I went really high on what I needed to do because I was treating symptoms. I was, we have the meeting about we need to get you really dry and that will take a toll in your kidney, but you will feel better. And she's like, hey, if I can breathe and be a skinny legs, I hate my fat legs. She said, I hate my fat legs, I want a skinny legs. I said, we're going to try to get your skinny legs, if that is important to you. That the kidney maybe get secret. Everybody agreed that that was important when we start doing that. We increase the oxygen, we add more inhalers. But things didn't improve much in terms of, we didn't see, I mean, her life got better. But after a few visits, it was very clear. This was not going to, go back to you, Gina, it wasn't going to get better. We have exhausted everything. So, you know, I went and went with my nurse and we hold hands and we asked family to be there. And that was the other challenge. The family perception is, my mom is so sick all the time that why you're telling me that she's sick? You see, when you live so close to somebody that you love, sometimes we don't see if they're getting worse. Oh, se está haciendo la chiflada, she's not that bad, she's, 
and, and we were struggling. We were new in her life for a few weeks, but we were trying to engage them and said, you need to start thinking about taking a family leave of absence. You know, I mean, we had done all of these things, but at some point we need you here. And then we finally had the thought where said, your mom is telling us. She's not going back to the hospital. And she wants to have you. And your mom is telling us that we have done everything and she's grateful for it. But she doesn't want it to be connected to a machine. She didn't want it, so we did all the advanced her planning. And we discussed at this point you also need her symptoms where it's sometimes worse at night. And my team can do Monday through Friday, but weekends. All the time we have somebody on call. But when you have the crisis at 2 a.m. in the morning, I couldn't send a nurse. But hospice does. So we talk about, are you ready to get more nurses here? Get a chaplain. She couldn't go to church, so she felt isolated. The church didn't know she was sick because nobody called the church. We needed a chaplain to coordinate the spiritual closure. We needed uh, other services, volunteers to be with her during the day if the fa while well, the family took the FMLA. And they were okay with that. It wasn't easy. It took us two family meetings to get into hospice. The daughter took the FMLA and she died two weeks after that. Surrounded by her family and her bed. She was able to, again, probably three, four days before she passed, she just couldn't get up anymore. But um, it, it, was, it was a good day, you know? In the midst of that and sorrow and suffering, it was a good day. And um, the family was grateful. They, they moved from, no, she's going to get better, to, I'm glad I took the FMLA. I'm glad I was here. I'm glad I could close time with my mom. It wasn't much. I wish it would have been longer, like many of other patients we have. They have, uh, or, or length of a stay in hospices, uh, uh, close to 95, 97 days. So that, that's really good when, I mean, considering the diseases, they are lasting longer. You know, they relax, the families have resources, they feel better. So we did all of these things. We put opioids, uh, we did the advanced care planning. She got a little bit of therapy. We wanted to be sure that if she was going to use the commode that she got already these, I'm not kidding you, 20 meters of oxygen cables on the floor. Oh, you therapists that have gone to the home and, and you're like, how oh, they are not tripping. So they needed to do some safety. So, but again, she just couldn't. So again, you exhausted all of those things. And the therapy wasn't curative. The therapy was to restore, if possible, some level of function. So what we did in WellMed is we created a model of a stratification where we can really have a sense of what the patient looks like and what will be the better place for service. So all the, the clinics in some of the specialty clinics have palliative care right now. We staff, I staff two clinics in the city. The rest of the time I'm driving and working with the seniors at home. We have, uh, when the patient is identified, the patient can go to the clinic. They come and they get a full geriatric assessment. They get symptom, symptom management scales. We talk about advanced care planning. And then if they are located geographically, we said you can come in intervals and get the palliative care services. We ask pain management, usually it's a lot of cancer, CHF, I do a lot of dementia care. And if the patient is frail enough and they are not leaving home, they can enter for um, home program. So the patient, uh, some of them are said, Dr. Rooks, I, I love what you're saying about more people at home, but ah, the work hospice is not for me yet, that sounds bad, but I will love that you take me at home and we will continue. We take care of those. We also have the one like, hey, remember Juanita Gonzalez? Yes, she was hospice. Yeah, well, she has been alive and she's gaining weight. Can you take her back? <laughs> Graduates from hospice. I get, I get a lot of those too. Because again, hospice does a lot of the everybody relax and then sometimes the patient actually get better. Yes. Yeah. Um, some of those come and I'm like, oh my gosh, you just look at them. I have done this for 14 years. So you're like, these just look like hospice. So we hold the hands. We hear what is important. And I said that day, we have, you know, probably weeks to months. This is your, and they said, please, we, we really were exhausted. We really need the resources, so they enter hospice. So again, we, we more or less stratify them. No hospice, palliative care only. They go to the PCP, but we see them in the palliative care clinic. They go straight to hospice or some. And I want to show you data, so this will come clearly later. 
So the bridges program is the household program. So that's, you remember uh, Dr. McQueen, the Dr. McQueen and the horse? So my horse is a Toyota hybrid. <laughs> it's 42 miles per gallon, right? But I go in, uh, Dr. McQueen and I go to your house, I'll put my bag, actually I have three bags, I have everything you need possible in my bag. And we do everything at home. We have a nurse, I have a nurse practitioner, I have a social worker. And we deliver the care for 45 minutes an hour, sometimes two hours. And if I need longer, I can stay long. And the important thing is what the patient needs at that moment and how we can really honor them and how we can prevent hospitalization. So, say, you know, I'm, I'm not there for, I need to make RBUs and go and move on. It's just, I have the time. You know, my goal is very different. It's not productivity, it's all their goals. So all the team is looking into how many visits we need. Well, these ladies are to need twice a week for the pill box and she needs a change in opioid. My nurse will be there twice a week. We work with home care dimensions, which is integrated in the model of care, so we do tons of home care and palliation and wounds in the house. If the patient gets sick, I can give them fluids in the home. I can get x-rays in the home. I can draw blood in the home. So everything, I also uh, have a splinted twice, couple of fractures at home until the orthopedic surgeon goes. We inject the hips, the knees, the hands. Um, don't, don't do Botox, make it clear. No <laughs> Botox available. So, but everything is done at home. And the idea is what I have told you for the past 40 minutes. We wanted to improve the patient's uh, symptoms. We wanted to involve the family. We wanted to help them to see. Some families, again, it's really hard for them to see. They are going to die. And family said, I wanted to know, so I prepare. So we try to do a good prognostication. Um, we help patients to clarify their values. Sometimes they always have gone to the ER because they didn't know they could call somebody and somebody could come to the home and then suddenly they don't go to the ER anymore because my nurse is dead next morning at 7 a.m. If they have pain, diarrhea, or a near ache, or mom looks a little bit confused. So it really changed completely a lot about the things that, that patients and families went through. Avoid unnecessary hospitalizations. The idea is that you develop very strong linkage with the primary care. They do not stop seeing the primary care if they don't want. So the standard doctor was, I love Dr. Ortega. Can I see him? Absolutely. But there are patients that said, I love Dr. Ortega, but I can't even know him out of the bed. I mean, so, so it's okay. We, again, continue collaborating. Um, so we, we don't take, we, even though we take over, we always are in communication with the primary care doctor. <clears throat> And again, uh, uh, Dr. Jampingi probably is going to talk about transitions of care. So this is Vaira, pay attention to her talk. She's going to tell you about the great models of care around that. We have one EMR, so our hospitalists can have access to the EMR at the hospital. It's mandatory for them to get their bonuses to call every single primary care. That was awesome. Every time my patient gets discharged, I get a phone call to myself. On drugs, I just this morning. One of your patients came here, dialysis, the cat was clad, she was more delirious, we do not have this and that, what do you think? I said, yes, great, can you please be sure to not stop this medication because if you do, she go bankers on the little husband. Okay, Dr. Rose, I'm glad that you said that, we're not going to stop it. And then, oh, did you check about, they were pending the Medicaid for the provider at home, can you please tell the case manager to follow up? Absolutely, Dr. Rose. How many of you wanted your grandma being checked out among all of those doctors and nurses that talk? Everybody, right? That should be a standard of care, but it's really hard to do so. So again, when you work in these organizations that are integrated and everything is paid for performance and everything is related with quality, everybody has an interest mm -hmm. to do a very good job because again, that, that depends a lot of other factors. So, that's a huge one. I love that about this organization, the level of communication. We see it every month, every, every week. There is something called the patient care coordination. And it goes like this. We have all the team. We have a case manager. We have the social worker. We have a hospice representative from Optum, because well, that is part of Optum. We have all the doctors, the nurses, and the administrator. And there is a preprinted list with all the patients that went to the ER that are hospitalized that are going to have an elective procedure. And we look into what can we have done differently so that patient wouldn't have ended up in the 
every week for an hour, an hour and a half. You have a small clinic, one hour. You have a large clinic, couple of hours. But everybody is tuning to that. And many of those patients are like, this patient just got diagnosed with cancer. It's metastasic Dr. Oaks. Can you see that patient? Sure. And with my nurse, my nurse does all that. She's a genius with the computer. She knows them up. Oh, Dr. Oaks, yeah, you are here this next week. We're going to see so-and-so next week. Dr. Oaks is in that area. We're going to book the patient. So again, it's really quickly because, again, when you are facing serious illness, you don't have time, right, to get lost in navigating a system, right? right. So again, there are gaps. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but those meetings weekly make a difference, and there is a lot of effort to see and tracking that. The other thing that I love, and I think Jumping will talk about that because we did that in the base unit, is every patient that gets discharged that you are aware of, which 99% of the time we know and well met, must be seen in 72 hours. And that is an indicator of quality improvement. So clinics get ding and lose money if your patients are not seen in 72 hours. Why? Because the data shows that the majority of readmissions happen because patients yes. were not seen fast enough, they needed other medications, they were confused when they got discharged, but the nurse does a great job of telling 20,000 instructions. Have you been there? Oh, and then it's mandatory that the nurse talk to them, but they are like, yes, 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 yes. And the lyrics, right? She's anxious to get out of there. Exactly. Yeah. They, so they go home and like, hmm, she told me I needed to take one twice a day. Which one is this? Hmm. Then they start guessing. Mm. And if they don't see very well and they don't read very well, then sometimes they small print. So again, in 72 hours, there, and we do it also, a patient that is at home that gets admitted, you bet where that is 72 hours. We try to do 24 internally because we wanted to be sure they really and the caregiver and everybody is really doing what it's supposed to. So all of these I'm doing, 10 minutes. More is, uh, this is just the story. There is, they love it. I mean, we, we hear over and over, you have made a difference. Um, thank you for being here. Wow, we were at the hospital every month, now we don't go. Um, they are satisfied. They feel that the social worker is, She's great also into listening. I will hope to have a psychologist and her team and a pharmacist eventually. Um, they feel that even if they're very debilitated, hey, you got me the therapy, I didn't know I was going to get better, and after the therapy, I got better. The spiritual issues are addressed. We try to engage them back to their churches, uh, work with organizations that bring spiritual support, bring volunteers, anything we can do. So let me show you data. So we started this enterprise at the end of 2013 as a pilot. When I joined Wellmed in 2014, we expanded completely fully because it proved a gigantic uh, saving cost. And since then, we are uh, we have two MDs. There is one uh, more MD coming, four nurse practitioner, one social worker, six RNs. Actually, we're in eight. This is just from two months ago. Uh, we have now six MAs, two LDNs. And we're building two teams, I'm the South team physician, the North side, so we're splitting into two complete teams that will require complete uh, kind of resources. But also because the, the impact economically and the patient satisfaction is so high. This is moving quickly, so we are now in Austin, Corpus Christi, Rio Grande Valley, and Paso, Florida, and Dallas. So again, this is exponentially expanding in all Texas and Florida. Yes, Maya. I noticed um, on the previous slide we had uh, yeah. one in Austin, one MD, and three PCPs. Is the PCP the same as an MD? Uh, it's a great question. The one MD, I'm a full-time geriatric palliative care. So my full-time job is to care for seniors at home and do palliative care clinic. Mm -hmm. A PCP <laughs> is full-time clinic. They don't go to the houses. Oh. So in certain markets, until we hire the right person to lead this in the community, you need to rely on these great doctors that are using half of a day to do the house call work. So that reason, if you see the PCPMD, that's what happens. So the idea is that all the markets will have geriatrics palliative care specialists that will work with primary care doctors or primary care doctors that have expertise due to their love for palliative care in geriatrics. You know, there are some that are really good at that. They don't have boards, but they love the seniors, they love the innovation, so. But uh, I, I'm the lead physician for San Antonio, so I manage all San Antonio market. Dr. Glazer is our medical director, she manages that, but she's expanding the model, so 
Uh, we foresee that for every 500 patients, we have one MD. For every 125, we have a nurse practitioner. And each nurse carries 50 patients. This is a nurse-driven program. So we have very outstanding nurses that know their patients like their palm of their hand. She knows when they eat at what time they get up because some of them don't want it to be, you know, awake before 9 a.m. Some of them wanted to have the nurse there at 7.30. So they, the nurse runs the program and we support her clinically uh, with the expertise. Um, we need to move on. So the idea is that we're running 100% in San Antonio. 90% of our pa patients have complete advanced care plan, 90%. Uh, the 10% that we don't is for multiple reasons, usually the loaners, nobody, so we are doing uh, directed to physicians with those because it is really hard to get somebody to represent them. So the physician will be getting the directed to physician. These are just number or target for the end of San Antonio will be close to 1,000 patients. Um, and this is how we look right now. Since the program started close to two years ago, we have seen 1,123 patients. We have a uh, touching and roller total of 845 patients. And some of them go to hospice, some of them have died, some of them have gone to long-term care, and some of them actually have graduated and go back to the primary care because they are uh, no homebound. Currently in Bridges, we have 410, approximately 200 in each path. And we have the palliative care clinic. These are people that are not in the home, but they continue seeing their primary care. They just come for expertise in palliative care, close to 300. 28% um, continually is a dynamic process of conversion to hospice. Uh, the national data and conversion rate is like 3%. So we are above the national standard of work because we walk the journey with the patient. We can see when they are ready to transition. Um, so you have national data, uh, 18 days, or patients right now is spending hospice 125 days. Remember the data I showed you 18 days, or patients are in hospice. So again, 125 days is better to prepare to, for your death, right? A little bit better, yeah. right, versus 18, so there is a difference there. 90% of our patients die at home, which is huge. I mean, that's very important for us. It does what they wanted. We're measuring it. They are dying at home. Dead without hospice, only 18 uh, out of 188. Only 10% didn't die with hospice. And that's for multiple reasons. I need to move on. Jose is already approaching. So again, uh, we definitely are big into transitions of care, interprofessional care. So this slide is fixed by itself. Um, again, we're really big into advanced care planning. Documented, available in the chart. Flag in the chart. Why? Because we can do a really good job, but if the hospital it doesn't get it, so we are really good. The case managers know where to find it. It's a scan. If a patient gets into another healthcare system, they will fax it immediately. So again, we're really into that transitions of care needs to happen um, in educating everybody so that the, the information actually is delivered in all the systems of care. Uh, due to time, I cannot spend a lot of time and money, but if you wanted to know is, since we started, pre-bridges to 2015, this is what the total care for patient was. So a patient was costing us around $2,251. When we're implementing bridges, there is a 50% reduction in cost. Wow. That's pretty, pretty good for a problem. Mm -hmm. So these patients, if you're into health economics, we have a health economics department. They run our data, we provide the data. It's a lot of intense work. But this is what the doctors also in the nurses and they are spending less time and less dollars in using those for something better. So again, it's a huge impact. Um, and then we, we definitely love what we're doing. Um, I appreciate the opportunity always, Mark and Jose and everybody at the Summer Institute who invited me. And um, hope to see you next year. I will take one or two questions before I close. And I really appreciate you here. But we needed to share with you on uh, palliative care and geriatrics. Well, yes, Mike. Yeah, I, I know that y'all use, uh, is it United Healthcare? Yes, Mike. So anybody that's outside United cannot enter into your program, is that correct? So great question. WellMed was bought by Optum, and Optum has sort of like two branches, United Healthcare and Optum. So WellMed is part of Optum. So we take care of patients that have United Health Insurance, but also any other insurance. We take all the ones that have managed care. So we take, Sir, it's right here. 
with Sexual Horizons, Aetna, Molina, um, uh, so many others. So what you can do is you need to call that number or a well-made number. I, I should have put the main number that I don't have to work for. And just ask, you know, hey, I have this insurance, what we need to do. Now, if you are fee for service, regular Medicare, we don't take you. So a patient needs to convert to Medicare managed care. Do you follow me? Right. So patients that have regular Medicare are in a, in a different model of care. If they wanted to receive the service through WellMed, they need to become WellMed, uh, Medicare managed care. No WellMed, but Medicare managed care. And that covers men. So like, uh, I, I, I have like, um, I, I don't remember what it's called, but I think it's advantage care, but it's, it's uh, with uh, Humana. But it's a PBO. So if you have that Humana, Humana ha a M MCI has also a house program. One of our nurse practitioners from the school runs that program. So Humana works with a different, but, but it's, it's no well made, but they also have a very good um, household program. Mm -hmm. So again, I know MCI, I interview with them. Too, so the reason I know. <laughs> <laughs> they have a great program, I don't know their data. I, I don't know their data, it would be great if you invited to TK to talk about that. Because we need to brainstorm, give ideas, you know, there is, we need to do a good job for the patients. That, that's our goal, you know, like we did a great job with the school and a, a lot of models of care developed on that, that's awesome. It's just we need to do more, but that, that's my short answer to you is just look with somebody that has more experience with the insurances, but we are beyond United Healthcare, you know, we take over. Do you mind? What about TRICARE for Life, like better than We have TRICARE for Life, I take care of three veterans that do not want it to come to the VA. They like to keep there, so we just work with them. And they have TRICARE for life. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a question? Yes, I wanted to know what you meant by that bridge program. OK, very good. So uh, just a clarification. Our program is called Bridges and Palliative Care. Oh, okay. The palliative care is the big umbrella. The bridges refers to the house call program. Okay. So we call a patient is in bridges, a patient enter house call program. But palliative care, because it's the big umbrella, uh, covers both house call and outpatient plan. <laughs> Absolutely. Great questions. Uh, one more. Again, awesome to see all of you and uh, some other friends that I haven't seen in a while. God bless you and thank you for my good you. Okay, thank you. the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the Rhine, the Parthenon, and moments on the Hudson River line.